Well, hello everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 260 of Goulet Q&A, and I'm wearing my special NASA shirt today to commemorate 50 years ago when the astronauts were just about to land on the moon for the first time. As of the publishing of this video, it will be tomorrow, July 20th, when the actual first moon landing happened. So pretty cool. I was not around when that happened, but I am living vicariously through memories and all of the different news articles and stuff that are coming out now. So it's pretty rad thinking about that a lot. Obviously there's been a lot of pen themed things that have been going on right now. I have the Saturn V rocket over here in Lego form, which was aside from the fact that it's the Saturn V rocket, it was just a cool Lego build, by the way, in case you happen to be curious about it, have it on your mind. I'm a bit of a Lego fan and uh, that was a fun build. In fact, I thought about, I like, should just tear that apart and then just rebuild it because it was such a fun build. Anyway, um, haven't had a whole ton of stuff going on here. It's July, you know, July is always slower for us in the pen world. So we have a lot of sales and deals and stuff like that, but you know, everybody's on vacation and traveling and kids are out of school and it's just a lot going on in life. So we tend to have fewer product launches and just kind of fewer things going on. We'll like do some interesting stuff, make things happen around here, but just fewer things, so to speak. So I actually like don't really have much of anything. Uh, let's talk about the Platinum Roca maybe coming here soon, maybe uh, this week, but I'm not sure about that even. So not really a whole lot to talk on on that front. Um, but you know, other things we have going on this week, um, we did at Goulet, in Goulet Pens land, um, our senior leadership team met, we had a strategic offsite. We do that once a quarter. Um, we do like a big annual one uh, in like the December, January timeframe. And then we try and do one every quarter uh, just because we believe uh, kind of every 90 days you need to revisit your strategic goals and uh, initiatives and things like that because priorities change and stuff happens. So um, we do that on a pretty regular basis. So we just had that this week. Um, so that is really helpful. Just if you're into leadership kind of stuff, that's a really helpful like meeting rhythm um, for us to be able to do that. Um, we got some ink sample sales going on, um, kind of going on throughout the whole month. We got a cleaning and tuning sale. Um, so a lot of those products are on sale as well. Um, we've been spending time uh, with our kids, getting them to bag up some converters and things like that. Uh, I have very fond memories of me in my childhood working my parents' print shop, you know, putting small things in bags and stapling things to other things, you know, like my entire spring break for multiple years of my childhood was spent you know, eight hours a day in a print shop, stapling things to things. Um, and that's how I saved up my money and paid my way through college, quite frankly. So uh, I'm trying to do the same thing. My kids are a bit young to be saving for college, but you know, we're, we're getting that ball rolling. Uh, but anyway, that's happening. So that's just like a cool little thing uh, for me to get to do, live vicariously uh, through my children working. I don't know if that's living vicariously. That might be the wrong context, but I dreamed in the early days of starting this business of having my kids kind of working with us in the business doing, you know, that type of work. And, uh, and when they get to do it now, it just makes me smile. So anyway, I pay my kids and treat them. Believe me, they get treated very well and take tons of breaks and they're like eating lollipops while they do it. Life is good for them. <laughs> I don't want you to think I'm some kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, tough boss or anything like that. But, uh, you know, they're my kids and they're, teach them how to work. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I'm going to try and try and cruise through Q and a this week. It should be pretty good. I got seven questions for you. Um, but yeah, should be, should be pretty rad. So in this episode, I'm going to be talking about, you know, proper writing position. Got some good stuff to talk about there. Um, great inks for read back, something I don't talk about a lot. Uh, and then one thing that I would change about fountain pens, if I could fountain pens in general. Um, so lots of good topics. I'm going to try and get into each of them a little bit. Uh, so let's start out with some pen and writing questions. First one is from Mark L on YouTube. Uh, what's the deal with numbers on friction feeds? I've seen what look like the same feeds on several brands of pens with various numbers on the underside. That's a great point. And in fact, I was going to pull some examples of some and forgot to do so. Um, so some feeds you notice on the underside don't really have uh, much going on. They're kind of just nondescript feeds. This is a feed that comes on uh, an Edison Herbert Belladonna. Sorry, not Edison. What am I talking about? Herbert Belladonna. And uh, this is uh, a feed. This is a Yovo housing feed combo. Um, but from what I understand, I don't have like super, super firm information around this because a lot of the sourcing and stuff like that is, is somewhat proprietary from one manufacturer to another. From what I hear from people in the industry, 
a um, lot of the pen manufacturers or even nib manufacturers are not actually making the feeds. The feeds are often made by other companies. You know, spoiler alert, most things that are manufactured in the world are sourced out from a lot of different places, right? So there's a lot of different components that come together to be a final product. Um, from what I understand, a lot of times the feeds are come from I don't know where, uh, but they come from places uh, and then get paired up with certain you know nibs and, and things such as this. Um, there are some pen manufacturers certainly who make their own feeds, especially the ones who are making them out of ebonite. Most of those are manufacturing their own. Um, then you have certain companies like Pilot and um, you know Aurora, um, Lamy, those they're actually making their own stuff. Uh, however, there are others who don't, you know, and that's perfectly fine. Feeds are a fairly specialized thing, and it's the kind of thing like if you're not making them in absolutely massive quantities, uh, the economies of scale are not there to produce them very efficiently. So it makes sense that there would be fewer of them making them in mass and then supplying them, you know, OEM out to. Um, other manufacturers. Um, so because of that, I actually don't know where most feeds are made, and I actually don't know um, what makes some different from others and all that, but there are definitely some shapes and subtleties that you can see that are different. So with that in mind, I wanted to try to show you a couple different pens that have them. Let me see if I can do it. No, nope, this one's the same. Okay, so some of them... Okay, give me one... Give me one second. I'm gonna find you one that has a number on it. Oh, here we go. Perfect example. Okay. Um, so this is an example I just showed you the, the Herbert, right? So these are Yovo sourced. Um, and uh, I'll show you one compared to uh, this stipula, which this is a stipula rainbow, uh, Vintidu. And uh, these nibs come from Bach. Okay. So both German manufacturers, um, but the feeds are slightly different, right? Uh, so here we go. I'm going to try and show you both of them next to each other. The question at hand here is referring more to like what you would see on the stipula one. So you see the shape is a little bit different on these feeds. And now these are both the same size nib. It's what would be called a number six size. Sorry, I'm trying to... <laughs> this is really hard to do backwards and blind because I can't see what I'm doing except through the monitor. Um, but you see on the stipula, dude, right here, this is... Uh, Got a little number on it, number five, okay? What does that number five mean? It's not a number five nib, this is a number six nib. Is it a number five feed, is it anything? Well, the crazy thing is sometimes you'll see a three, sometimes you'll see a four. It must be something of like a batch indicator or something for the feed manufacturer. There's nothing that I've ever been able to tell, and Drew and I have had conversations about this because he's looked at a lot of these too. There's nothing that either of us have really been able to tell uh, that makes a difference from one to another based off that number that you see on the bottom of that feed. Um, now, certainly if one has a number and then you have another one that doesn't, it might be a different manufacturer altogether, um, slightly different feed design, I don't know. And a lot of the manufacturers, even if they're sourcing out feeds, they will test them and make sure that they write and everything properly. So I wouldn't really be concerned about how well will my pen write based on whether the feed has a stamped number on it versus not versus whatever. I don't know that that's necessarily something to be actively concerned about, but even within a manufacturer like that stipula, you might see a five, you might see a three, you might see another number. Um, it's got to be some kind of internal thing within the feed manufacturer that has nothing to do with, with anything that would affect you or me or anybody else. It just happens to be you can see that number. Um, so I don't think it's anything significant and I don't really know what it is. I just know that um, it's there, and there sometimes is different, but they all seem to perform the same. So there you go. Doesn't need to stress you out, but just know that on some pens, you might see it there. Cool. All right, Savannah S. on Facebook. Will you ever do another exclusive Bennu Hexagon? Because the Titan is glorious, and I need another one Rachel has her hands in. Okay, so this is the Bennu Titan. This is an exclusive that we did with them. Uh, it's a dark purple, it's got big chunks of glitter in it, it has blue luminescent ends on it so it will glow in the dark. Uh, it takes a converter, it is eyedropper convertible, 
has a number five stainless steel nib. So it's got a lot of cool things going on with it. It's based off the hexagon model, so it's got that hexagonal texture to it. Uh, and it's a pretty cool pen. We were really happy to be able to do this one. We still have them uh, available. We had to basically, when we do exclusives like this, a lot of times we'll have to buy in like a minimum quantity. We'll buy all one batch. And then if we think it's gonna be super, super popular and we wanna make it ongoing, we'll make it ongoing. Um, you know, think uh, the Edison Nouveau Premier, right? So like those, we do have a seasonal version of that, but we'll also do regular editions and it's been available, like the Cappuccino, for example, has been available for eight years. Um, other ones, we'll have them go uh, longer, right? Or, or shorter, sorry. We'll just buy them in a batch like this. We buy a certain number of them and that's it. And then once they're gone, they're gone. You know, the Edison, sorry, dang it, I keep calling it Edison. The Herbert Belladonna, same kind of deal. There's 300 of them. Sometimes we'll number them. There'll be limited edition numbers. Sometimes we won't. It just depends on the individual, you know, thing that we negotiate with the manufacturer. Um, you know, but this pen, we made 300 of them. If it sells out in a week, that's it. If it sells out in two years, that's it too. Um, it really just depends on what's going on. And of course, price and all these different things come into play. Um, but anyway, that's what's going on there. So, you know, certainly we could look to do another hexagon. We could look to do another any other type of premiere, or, or uh, I'm mixing up all my names today. Another type of uh, Banu, right? So like you have the Banu Supreme, you have different models, things that we could look at, the Minima, Ballistica. So we could do all different types of, um, all different types of models with different colors. We could, we, if we wanted to, I mean, and, and it depends too, like what the materials are. Banu, they actually, you know, they like manufactured it all from scratch. So, I mean, we had prototypes of this where the glitter was really, really fine, where it was really chunky. And we were like, oh, we like the chunky glitter better. So that's what we, we built it off of. Um, you know, so if we wanted to come back and do another version and say we want it to be green with a purple tr translucent ends with small glitter in it on a, on a you know, Supreme, we could, we could design that. Um, depending on how many we do and all that, how complicated it is, they would get back and, and tell us how much it would cost and how many minimum that we would need and all that. So there's certainly factors at play there. Um, you know, but for us, we, depending on the time of year, depending on, you know, how much, how much we have to invest in said projects like these, you can imagine if we're buying hundreds of pens at a time, it's a bit of money for us to tie up just as a business. Um, so we can have a certain number of them outgoing, but if we have a bunch of them outstanding. You know, we've got Retro 51s, we've got Edison's, we've got Herbert's, we've got Banu's, we've got all kinds of different things with Conklin and everybody else. So if you like, you look at, we got Stipula the Achurias, um, the Stipula Rainbows. If you look at all these different exclusive pens that we have, pretty much all of these are ones that we bought in a large chunk and we've outlaid all that cash at the beginning and we've got to sell through them before we can cycle new stuff in. So we have to be conscious about the money just in terms of general business. We gotta be conscious about how we're staging out our money. And especially as we're like in the summer, sales go a little bit down in the summer and then we gotta start buying up for the holiday season. So there's some seasonality and it ties up a lot of money going into the holidays. You know, that's big, big secret here. Um, that's part of why we run sales in the summertime is because we're a little bit slower, but we also wanna free up cash so that we can, um, you know, cycle stuff through and stock up for the holidays, do new projects and these types of things. So, um, you know, we're very conservative with our money. Um, we're never like on the brink or anything like that, but we, we try to be conscious of these things. So it's a certain number of projects that we'll commit to, um, a certain amount of cash that we'll tie up and we're having conversations about that regularly as a team um, before we'll commit to new ones. So we have ideas kind of in the back burner about other things we could do. Uh, for right now, we want to let the site, the Titan, uh, ride out a little longer before we look to do the next project, but absolutely it's something that's on the table that we could do. And if you got any feedback about that, if you really love, you know, we talked about doing a Supreme, we talked about doing some other models of Banu, um, that would be really kind of cool. So uh, I would love to have some options there uh, and, uh, and have an idea in mind from you all, if you're like, yeah, I really love this, that, or the other um, feature, or, you know, I love this, but it's gotta have a number six nib, you know, and it's like, okay, maybe we lean towards the Supreme, because that's got a number six. Excuse me. Um, so there you go. And just in case you're curious, if you see me flashing this one around, this is the this is the Supreme Azure. They're actually discontinuing this one, um, but I bought one myself because it's blue, and I wanted to have it for reference. So if you're curious about that one, it may be available around, but we're probably not gonna pick it up because they're gonna be sunsetting that one, I believe. Um, and then, yeah, that pretty much takes care of that. So if you got any ideas, drop it in the comments, let my team know, and we will rattle that around in the old noodle um, as we're thinking about future new projects or other products. 
Art at Lay Souls on Twitter says, I sometimes get sore when I write. I think that I never really learned the correct posture for writing. What would be your tips or suggestions? And I'm left-handed, which probably doesn't help. Okay, so one really cool thing about fountain pens in general is that they don't really need a lot of pressure when you're writing them. So if you have a fountain pen, if you're used to writing with ballpoint pens um, or pencils or anything like that, it needs a little bit of pressure and a little bit of friction in order for it to write properly. Fountain pens, though, they flow just by capillary action. So a properly writing fountain pen, uh, when you have it tuned and it's flowing well, not like tuned like you need to take it to a Nibmeister, but when, it's, when it should be tuned properly, um, it should more or less write under its own weight. And I'm let's make sure that I can hold it at the right angle and get it done. Okay. So here, like, just held under its own weight. Can you see that? Yeah. So literally just through its... <laughs> it's hard for me to do this again. I look at it. When it's held at the right angle and all that kind of stuff, it should write under its own weight. I don't need to press on it. I don't need to scribble it and get it started and bear down. Um, it should just work, right? So uh, that is actually a huge advantage when you're talking about being sore. Because if you think about when you have a regular, you know, <laughs> do I even have a ballpoint pen to use as an example? I do. I have a big crystal here. Just, to, just for examples such as these. You know, these kind of things, it's not going to write under its own weight. Uh, it's, well, it's very lightweight for one, but it requires friction and it requires that ball to, to um, you know, rotate uh, under a certain amount of friction to melt the paste that's inside of this so that it, uh, you know, actually writes and leaves a mark on the page. That's how ballpoints work. Um, so they need a certain amount of friction. I don't know scientifically how much friction versus a fountain pen, but um, uh, it needs some. So you got to bear down a little bit. Often the pens are thinner too, so you, you got to grip and it's tighter and you're, you end up, what happens is you end up kind of gripping and contorting your fingers and using a lot of your finger muscles when you write. Now, um, there's different things going on here. Um, and I made all these notes that made it sound great and now I'm jumping around. So let me go through my notes and talk to you because I have some great resources here. Um, so in the big picture, fountain pens can be really great if you have hand cramping issues because when you hold it properly and get the hang of writing with it, um, it can actually strain your muscles much, much less, um, which can be particularly great if you have things like arthritis or any other type of um, you know, hand tendonitis or anything like that. Um, it can be way more comfortable writing uh, than it would with other types of writing instruments. Um, so when you're holding a fountain pen, um, there's kind of an ideal angle. You know, they make the pens to be ground so that you can write with certain angles, but really about a 45 degree angle. It can go up or down a little bit from there, but that's kind of about the sweet spot for it. Um, a three finger grip is really kind of ideal. There's some people who do four and other types of things too. That's okay, but really a three finger grip is kind of optimal. Uh, and then as a lefty, you know, hand position is gonna be important. Uh, if you think about like, here's the, here's the line that, that you're writing on you know, and you have, you want to write at about a 45 degree angle from wherever the line is. Uh, and then, you know, there's the 45 degree up and down from the page this way, but then there's also a 45 degree angle from uh, where the line is. So now if you're looking at the line on the page, I want about 45 degree angle of the pen going this way too. I don't know if that is clear or makes sense, but um, just think in 45s and you'll be in pretty good shape. As a lefty, you know, you have your lefty as an underwriter, which is like if the line is here and, you're, and your hand is staying under the line. Side writer, where your hand is smearing right over top of it, which is pretty common. And then you have overwriter or hook-handed, where your hand is actually over top of the line. And this is where things can get kind of crazy because um, I've seen a lot of people who will do like some really severe hooks and these types of things. And if you think like if your hand is kind of like this, and you're writing like this, like you're, you're straining a lot of the finer muscles in your hand. That's not really ideal. And you think about if you're a righty too, and if I was writing hook-handed as a righty, not as common, um, you know, I think because there's a common, there's all kinds of reasons why you can pontificate why lefties may have more varying writing positions than righties. Generally speaking, righties are all underwriters, but lefties tend to be all over the place. A lot of it is because most teachers didn't really know what to do with lefties or most school desks weren't made for lefties. So lefties basically were left to their own devices to come up with all kinds of interesting and inventive ways to figure out how to write, which may or may not be proper for 
muscle usage over time, right? So there is a kind of a proper method um, for writing that is based on, um, you know, what is helpful for writing of long writing sessions. This is where it's super helpful to have um, some expertise, which I barely do. Um, but what's super helpful is a book that we have called The Art of Cursive Penmanship. So it's a, kind of a thick book <laughs> that talks about handwriting, and it's an instructional book. Um, and it's about 250 pages or so um, from Master Penman and calligrapher Michael Sull. Uh, and he uh, has done handwriting in uh, calligraphy schools for years. He's trained the current White House calligrapher, lead, the head staff calligrapher there, um, and has about 10 pages in this book devoted to hand position, posture, paper position, all these types of things. I'll summarize some of what he talks about here, but I mean, it would take me 10 minutes and maybe more to read everything that he's got in here. Um, but basically he talks about finger and arm movements um, and really basically like you, you should be moving your hand across the page every four to six letters that you're writing. Um, and then uh, you need to have a combination of writing with your fingers, your wrist, and your arm. Because basically as your arm goes up, your muscles are bigger up here. You know, so if you think like people who are master calligraphers, they train for long periods of time to use much more of their arm, shoulder, and elbow when they're writing. They keep more of their fingers and, and wrists still as they write because these muscles are bigger and they won't get as tired. But there's less fine control in these muscles, so you need to spend a lot of time practicing to get that muscle memory when doing that. People who aren't writing as often, you need more of a combination. You need to be using some of your finer motor skills here in your hand and your wrists. Uh, but if you're doing only that for long periods of time, or if you're, you know, curled up in your bed and crunched over writing on your journal, you're not gonna be able to write more than a page or two without starting to cramp up and feel kind of bad because you're really straining those small muscles that you have in your hand and your wrist and stuff like that. So having a proper position, sitting up at a desk, where your arm is able to be at about a 90 degree angle. So if you're too low, that can cause your elbow to cramp up, that can cause your wrist to bend, that's gonna put strain on those muscles. Being high up enough where your arm can be kind of hanging in a natural position, um, and then having it where your paper is in the proper position too, you wanna to turn your page so that you are having that kind of natural 45 degree angle. Now you might have to turn it kind of severely if you're like a lefty and you're a side writer or an, or an over writer. Um, it can get kind of interesting there. You know, he's got some figures in here in his book about like how to turn it in different, you know, different ways to match your, your hand position here, the position of the paper. Um, he's got some posture things here, talks about like where the paper should be positioned over your eye line. I mean, it gets pretty specific here. Um, yeah, pen holding position in the hand, you know, shows that kind of three finger grip there. Uh, and so, you know, talks about not gripping it too much and, you know, not having your fingernails getting in the way and all these types of things. The arrangement of letters, the slant and all this type of stuff, and it just goes more and more detailed from there. Um, so yes, I think as long as you are, you are writing with it, turn the paper however severely you need to to alleviate some of the strain on your hand. Um, make it show, so that you are trying to use more of the big muscles and sitting in like a proper, if you're gonna be writing more than just like a quick note, if you're gonna be journaling for a couple of pages or whatever, you know, sitting down at a proper desk or table or something like that is gonna help that strain quite a bit. And I think largely that, that covers what I wanted to say about that. So lots you can get into about that. Um, but yeah, that should about cover it. All right, I got an in question from Isabella R. in an email. I used to fall for really vibrant, saturated inks and still do. But when reading back old notes, some of the duller and softer colors like Arush, Izuku, Ajisai, are actually more pleasant to read back than the really dark or saturated ones. Funny how tastes can change. Which inks do you think offer, offer the best readback? So readback is a term that's not 
often thrown around a whole lot in the fountain pen world. You know, I think a lot of people who are journaling, bullet journaling, or you're journaling for posterity's sake or something like that, readback is going to be a little more important to you. Um, maybe than if you're just writing quick to-do lists that you're going to end up tossing and throwing away, maybe just using for the day. Um, it's kind of thing like, you know, anybody who reads a significant amount, um, you know, the type of paper you use, the intensity, the color of the, the ink um, is going to make somewhat of a difference. And it's really a preferential thing. Um, you know, you can make an argument that like having a higher contrast can actually make it easier to read in these types of things. So it's, it's very, very preferential, but I thought it was at least something to touch on because it resonates with something that, that I share, uh, at times as well. I'm a sucker for all the darkest and most saturated inks. And I have been from day one, but I have some old journals of mine that are about 10 years old. Um, that, uh, you know, back when I first, first, first started getting into fountain pens and was first testing out some of the, um, the ink that I was using, I uh, had things like Diamine, um, China Blue, you know, and I have like notes on white notebooks that um, I was using there. I'll show you that real quickly at a glance. Uh, and then I was taking notes and things like, you know, this is, I mean, this is literally testing out a new color of ink. Um, this is uh, Jerba Amber de Bramani. Um, it's a nice color. And it looks like gold. What a beautiful color. Uh, Jerba Persier de Lune. This is back when it was Jerba, not just Jerba. And I have like infant care notes from classes I was taking before our son was born, and now he's nine and a half. So it's interesting even just to flip through this. It's like trip down memory lane. Um, and then I have some interesting notes here from like, you know, these are the notes of the first, the first. Um, when I was thinking about setting up a blog. <laughs> so this is before uh, the Goulet Pens blog existed. It was called Inc. Nouveau at the time. And in fact, I was considering calling it L'Inc. Nouveau in French. So Inc. Nouveau only in French. Because at the time we had Claire Fontaine and Rodia and you know, my heritage is French. So I was like, maybe I'll just go all French. I was like, no, I'm kind of glad we looked a little bit beyond that. That's okay, there's a lot of other great companies too. But then like I flipped to this note where I read um, Gary Vaynerchuk's book Crush It for the first time. Some notes I had from there and it's like this ink, I don't even know what color this is to be honest with you, um, but it's kind of like a bright orangey red. And so when I flip the page going from a Poussière de Lune and looking at that, I'm like, okay, this is very pleasant. And I look at that and I'm like, oh, wow, this is much brighter, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when you look at whole pages of it. And it's like, it's fine when I read it for a while, but it definitely makes kind of an impression. And I imagine if I was reading like an entire notebook of this brighter orange ink, I would be like, oh, okay, I need to change it up here a little bit. And then when I go back to, you know, I read the book Tribes by Seth Godin, I went back to my Amber de Bramani, and it's like, oh, it's just a much more pleasant readback for me. So I do feel like readback is a factor if it's something that you feel like you're going to be referencing on a regular basis. You know, and then I have like other things I was testing out and the type of pen you use, like these are both um, Poussière de Lune here, but like in a, in a broader, um, um, what's it called? The Pelican Script, uh, a stub nib pen. Um, it looks darker, so even the nib type that you use can make a difference. Um, it's just something to maybe take into consideration. You know, try it out on your own. Look at some of the other ones. Okay, and then I've got, uh, you know, a nice turquoise color that I was using here. I was like, okay, turquoise. So there's that for some readback. How does that look? That's kind of cool. This is from like 2015. So this is probably Diamine Marine, if I had to guess. This would have been about the time that I was really getting into that ink and I've mm, kind of stuck with it too. Um, yeah, interesting. So that's interesting. And this is on bright white paper too. Uh, and then I had some other ones that I had in off white paper. So. Um, yes, I do think it's important to take into consideration the readback. Some of the, to get to your, your actual question here, you know, which ink do you think offers the best readback? Uh, I think generally speaking, inks with, uh, that are a little more, more watery, less saturated, less vibrant, no sheen, no shimmer, uh, trying to go with stuff that's relatively flat and kind of subtle or subdued um, are gonna be some of the better ones uh, for readback. 
purely a per personal preference thing. So Urban Persier, Poussier de Lune, Lee de Tay are a couple that come to mind from my early days there. Uh, Amber de Bramani as well. Uh, Pilot of Roshizuku, many of them. You mentioned Ajisai, Azagao. Um, certainly, you know, a lot of the blue, the lighter blues could to work in there. There's a lot of really good colors. The Murasaki Shikibu is pretty good too. A lot of Pelican Edelstein inks are good. Roaring Klingner, Salix, and Scaviosa. Buzo as well, Noodler's Lexington Gray. Some of those I like too, like Salix, Gaviosa, Lexington Gray. Those are good because they have a, a permanence to them as well. Um, so anything where you can have permanence in a journal uh, that also has good readback too, that's like a nice one-two punch there because you feel better about the longevity of that ink lasting in that notebook, um, even if there was a, a water spill or something on it. Uh, and then that could be really helpful. And then um, I was flipping through my, my other notebook. This is an old Rhodia. Uh, web notebook uh, where I was just testing out all different kinds of colors and stuff like that. Um, you know, and you can get an idea of some of the readback on off-white as well. Now I think in general, in terms of readback, off-white actually reads back a little, a little more pleasant than bright white paper. Just the whiteness of the paper itself will cause a little more starkness in the ink color, which if you're trying to get the ink to really pop, white paper is actually better, but if you want um, something to look a little more subtle, uh, the off-white paper can actually be a little better in that respect. So I'm looking back through some of like my old like various notes I had from various leadership meetings and these types of things. So I'd use like a, a more subtle, kind of a dark blue and, uh, and use those. So that's kind of cool. And then, um, yeah, I was trying to think, like, I have, you know, some of, like, the notes. I'm just kind of taking a trip down memory lane, like, pulling out some of these old notebooks. But, you know, I have, like, some things when we were looking to do our first purpose statement, you know, to, to blank that business should be personal or, or can be personal. So I was, like, to affirm, uphold, demonstrate. And it's just kind of, like, brainstorming various things. So stuff like this that I may want to flip back through. I did, like, a mind map of, like, Maybe fulfillment is part of our purpose. And I was like writing down all the different things related to that. Um, looking back at that, I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. And uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't jump out and like punch me in the face. Um, whereas I'm looking like something just plain black, you know, that kind of does a little bit. It does just punch me a little bit more or a bright orange or, you know, something with shimmer and sheen and all this type of stuff um, would be a little more impactful there. But to summarize it all up, um, I think it's something interesting to think about, you know, it, Rather intuitively, you can look back at your own notes and you can see the things that are a little bit easier to read back to your own eyes. Um, and then maybe just keep that into account. If you're writing letters to somebody or if you wanna hang on to something and refer back to it a bunch of times, maybe just take into consideration that read back factor. Um, I don't find that the read back is a dominant factor for me in the ink choice that I'm using. I think that uh, whatever feels good to me as I'm writing it is more important just because um, that's what's going to cause me to want to write and pick up my pen and, and actually write with it. So oftentimes I end up gravitating more towards my brighter, punchier, more interesting colors just because that's what feels good to me at the time that I'm writing it, which will inspire me to write more, which will then give me the opportunity to read it back because if I don't actually write it in the first place, then I can't read it back. So anyway, that's my perception of it. Hopefully that was helpful to you and I appreciate you prompting me on that one. Uh, for paper, so I have a question from Michael B. on Facebook. Can you explain how the weight of paper helps or impacts how fountain pen friendly it is? I know different inks will react differently, but I get lost when I see a sheet has so many grams. For example, Rhodia paper is 80 gram and 90 gram paper, but how much does the extra 10 grams actually help? I'm trying to understand the correlation so I can find copy paper that may be fountain pen friendly at work. Okay, so. Um, I've answered this in various capacities before, but it's, I think it's good to revisit paper every now and then, especially as I've been doing Q&A for five years now. Five years? Maybe six years. I feel like it was 2013 when I started this. Wow. Anyway, so paper is always good to talk about because new people come in and paper is like one of the most overlooked aspects of the fountain pen lifestyle. Um, I definitely think it's a little bit confusing if you're not like neck deep into the world of paper. Even if you are, it's still confusing because there's a little bit of a, you know, 
uh, snake oil kind of thing that can happen in the paper world where you know you look at the gram weight of paper or something like that and uh, a lot of times people say that something is ink friendly and in fact it's completely made up or people the standards are completely different there's no there's no paper police out there that they really say any of this so um, uh, the, the grams that you're talking about here 80 gram 90 gram whatever or sometimes it's GSM or GS with a number two grams GS 2M, you know, there's all kinds of different designations, but the, the, the gram weight, what that means is that's, that's grams per square meter. So if you take one square meter of that paper and you weigh it, that's how much it weighs. So it's sort of an indication of thickness, because you could think that, you know, generally speaking, if a paper is thicker, it's probably going to weigh more. It's not 100% the case because you can have a higher clay content and you can have more sizing and stuff like that that's on the paper that might increase its weight without necessarily making it thicker. So there's, but you know, they don't break down all the super most, you know, most detailed um, aspects of paper. Um, they basically go with like number of sheets, maybe the gram weight on some finer papers, and then maybe some indication of whether it's smooth or textured or water, you know, mixed media or something like that, watercolor paper, car and maybe it's cardstock, maybe it's sheet stock. But generally speaking, you're not going to get all the information you need. Um, so what I found specifically in context of what you're asking about, which is you want to find copy paper for fountain pen friendly at work. Copy paper is even a step further removed from reality in terms of uh, how it's going to work with a fountain pen uh, and what is advertised on it, especially if you're buying in the U.S. Because in the U.S., fountain pen friendliness is absolutely 0% considered with copy paper um, from pretty much every manufacturer. You can buy some really nicer papers in Europe and France and stuff like that, but in the U.S., like... You know, the Hammer Mill and, you know, Georgia Pacific and all these like big, you know, paper mills and stuff like that. How many people are using fountain pens on printer paper is, I can guarantee you, 0% on anybody's mind in these paper mills. Um, I can't say 0%. Point zero 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 one percent There might be one or two people in the whole country that care about that um, who are impacting the marketing of these paper products. Um, but uh, I'll try to give you a rough guide, but Unfortunately, largely, you are going to have to experiment and see which papers perform best with your fountain pens. But it, I can at least guide you a little bit. Um, so if you're looking at copy paper, laser printer paper is going to be way better for you than inkjet printer paper. Because inkjet ink is actually a little more viscous, um, a little more liquid. Uh, and so the number one priority with a printer, an inkjet printer when it prints, is that it dries quickly. Uh, so they make the paper to be absorbent so that that liquid ink will dry quickly into the paper and not smear. Because if it's printing page after page and it's smearing, then that's not good for the printer companies because people get mad about that. Um, so if you're buying just regular inkjet paper, which is probably a lot of what you are dealing with, um, it's going to be very absorbent and bleed through and not be great for fountain pens at all. Because the point is that it dries quickly. So it'll, you'll have great dry time, but it's going to sacrifice everything else. You're not going to get good sheen. You're not going to get good shading. You're not going to get good shimmering if you've got that as a factor in your ink. But you will get good dry time. Um, going with laser printer paper. So laser printers use toner. It's like an actual pigment instead of a dye that soaks into the paper. So using toner, it heats up the toner, and then it basically prints it onto the surface of the laser paper. So laser paper is generally a little bit smoother, less absorbent, and the, the laser stuff sticks to the top of it. So if you're using a fountain pen, laser printer paper just inherently is going to be a little more ink resistant, which is going to give you a little bit better fountain pen ink performance. Now it's not all created equal, um, so that is something that you'll have to test. In fact, we've had to go through a number of them because as we've printed out you know, copies of our sheets that we put in your, your packing slips, you know, uh, in your orders, you know, we've looked at using really nice fountain pen friendly paper, especially back in the day when we used to actually write a handwritten thank you note on your, you know, packing slip. Excuse me, the logistics of that broke down several years ago, but we used to do that back in the day. So we used to use really good paper for printing all the packing slips. So we would go through a lot of it. Um, HP had some really good stuff. They had a 28 pound paper that was amazing. They discontinued that. So at that point, we either had to go like a 32 pound or a 24 pound. 
and the difference was in price was like 20 bucks a ream versus eight bucks a ream. You know, previously we were paying like nine, 10 bucks a ream. So we ended up not going the 20 buck per ream route uh, because we were using so much paper and it wasn't primarily used for fountain pens. Uh, so we went the other route. Um, so, you know, there are some options there. There is generally an indication of, okay, so the gram weight, that's like a European and, and uh, Asian, um, you know, international uh, pay, weight measurement. Of course, the U.S. does everything differently because it's got to be complicated, right? So the weight of paper um, is in poundage here in the U.S., um, so like 24 pound versus 32 pound, and then when you get up into cardstock, it gets up into the 70s and 80s and stuff like that. Um, I'm going a little bit off memory. I went to research and wasn't able to find like the exact one-to-one, -one, but I believe a 24 pound paper is somewhere around like the 70 to 75 gram weight average, maybe closer to 80. Going with something more like a 32 pound, you're looking in that 90 to 100 range. GSM, right? So the equivalent. So if you're going with like a 28 to 32 pound paper, that's getting you more into that fountain pen friendly range, generally speaking. So really that 80 to 90 is kind of a sweet spot um, for having something that's thick enough to generally speaking be pretty good with fountain pens or where it won't go through the back and you won't be able to read through. Um, of course, all these other factors could mean it's absorbent and all this type of stuff. Um, but that, as far as the thickness goes, that's generally pretty good. Um, getting into much thicker, you're getting into like cardstock thickness and it's just not as practical as like a, just an everyday paper, but that's totally a personal preference thing up to you. Um, price can loosely be an indicator of how good it is. Uh, I think going with something that's acid free, pH neutral, those are really important um, for longevity because if you don't have those, if you have um, acidity in your paper, that's where it yellows and breaks down. If you think like a newspaper after a month, it's like all yellow and it starts to crinkle and all that. That's because um, you know it's got it's got it's not it's not um, pH neutralized. Um, what happens is they end up bleaching the paper and then they use acids to neutralize the bleach, and often that leaves the paper too acidic. Those acids continue to break down the paper over time. That's why something like newspaper uh, ends up breaking down relatively quickly. Quickly, so um, they'll use different chemicals or they'll pro more properly balance them out so they're more neutralized when they leave at, with some of the nicer papers. So for longevity and storing them uh, and being able to reference them in the future, that's really important. It's especially important with things like bound journals because you want those to last a really long time. Maybe you care less about that with copy paper, I don't know. Um, but it's a nice thing to look out for. So I think some of the best copy paper out there, I'm not a copy paper connoisseur, quite honestly, um, but the, the HP 32 pound premium laser paper um, is some of the best stuff that I've bought by the ream at the office supply store. That's the $20 you know, per ream stuff that I was talking about. But there's 500 sheets in a ream. So it goes pretty far if you're using it mainly for fountain pens. If you're printing everything out on it, yeah, it can really add up. Um, but again, it's been, a while, it's been a while for me. It's been several years since I've really evaluated this because we're printing less and less here at the office. And, um, you know, largely um, we're using, you know, our own, you know, rhodia pads and stuff like that. So it's, it's a little bit less of a, a thing for us these days. Um, but it's, in my experience, it's the kind of thing you'll take what I'm giving you here, go with something, the highest poundage that you can in practicality. Spending a little bit more often can help going for those pH neutral, acid free, that kind of thing, laser paper. Um, and then just, you're gonna have to maybe buy a couple of reams and just try them out and see what you really like. Cause a lot of people have different personal preferences. And then once you settle on something you really like, buy a bunch of it and hope it never changes. <laughs> That's been my experience. All right, personal question. This is from Armando Yu on Facebook. If you had the power to change one thing about all fountain pens, such as getting rid of proprietary cartridges, what would you change? Actually, Armando, your recommendation here, getting rid of all, getting rid of proprietary cartridges, that's not bad. Um, that is kind of a big one. I think that might be the thing that I would do. Thinking through it a little bit more, you know, I do like to disassemble a lot of my pens because I'm kind of a tinkerer. I often wait too long to clean my pens, and so I've got to like do a full kind of restorative clean when they've been sitting there for three or four months and it's all dried out and crusty. Um, so having pens that can all be fully disassembled or maybe come with tools like Twisby's, for example, that come with the tools to disassemble them, super appreciate that, and I really like that. 
that's a very specific preference for me. So like just selfishly, that would be kind of cool. Um, you know, but I think the proprietary cartridge thing, it's like as a fountain pen connoisseur, as a retailer, as something you're like, I don't love the fact that we have to stock all these different ones that you are so confused about all these different, which one fits that. And well, I really like the Lamy Turquoise color, but I can't use it on my Pilot Metropolitan unless I siphon it out with a syringe and use this, that, and the other. Like part of it's a little bit fun because you get to tinker around a bit, but part of it also is like, man, if everybody, if truly everybody used a standard international cartridge, like wouldn't that be so much more convenient? But it's just not practical, not reality, but that wasn't the question. That would be like if every car used the same alternator. Like, yes, in theory, that would make it so much easier because you wouldn't have to look up all these, or wiper blades, windshield wiper blades. Ah, oh, I hate having to buy windshield wiper blades. I can never remember what size mine are and which they fit and all that. You know, but of course then, obviously, that would restrict other things if everything was truly standard like that. But still, you know what I mean? Like. That would be really that would be really convenient. So I think you're you're pretty spot on with that one. So the dis, everything would be disassemblable would be kind of cool for me. Um, and then while we're at it with the disassembly thing, why not have like replacement parts available? I'm a tinkerer. I'd like to be able to replace my parts. Logistically, that would be an absolute nightmare as a retailer for me to stock replacement parts for every single pen that we've ever made. Um, and I understand why that doesn't happen. But as a fountain pen user, that would be really kind of cool if I was able to buy a new whatever grip or something like that if I ever needed to for some obscure pen. Um, and then another thing, this is kind of a distant third, but I'll throw it in here too, because didn't you ask me for three opinions? Well, I'm gonna give them to you. Um, <laughs> no, you asked me for one and I'm giving you three. Uh, no, my one officially is the, the proprietary cartridge thing. That one's pretty solid. Um, but my, my other one is having standardized nibs across brands. I really don't feel as passionately about this one. It would be kind of convenient to be able to swap nibs and stuff across different brands. But I also really like having different style of nibs. I really like the Vanishing Point. Clearly, I like the huge nib on a Pelican M1000 or a Namiki Emperor or something that's very impressive and formidable. Uh, you couldn't have that on a Pilot Vanishing Point obviously because it's a retractable and it just it wouldn't make sense so it would not make sense to have all pens be swappable and replaceable with each other and stuff like that but maybe just a little bit more than they are you know that would be kind of convenient um so that would be kind of cool again just going with my swappable disassembly kind of thing um would be kind of neat so that's that um good solid question though made me think a little bit all right and then i got one more question to wrap up for you this week this is from crystalline uh, r on facebook and this is a business question as I've been broadening my experience and exposure, I've realized that the sorting and filtering available for shopping on the Goulet website is way beyond what is available on most other sites and really fairly unique. Comparatively, some sites really look like they haven't been updated and designed since the early 2000s. Has that been an active decision on uh, for your business to choose to develop those additional features and if so, why? An extension, I can e easily imagine that web design actually has an impact on traffic and business. Do you feel that it's an investment you've made that pays off in driving your business? Okay, so yeah, this sort of like touches on you all uh, because basically if you're watching this, you've been to our website probably. I imagine if you're this far in, you've probably seen our website. If not, go to goodlypens.com, check it out right now. Um, okay, so web stuff. I. I really don't like to like pick apart anybody else's website. Web design is really hard. E-commerce is really complicated and hard and website, you know, and I have Rachel. Like Rachel is a, a, a sorceress when it comes to web stuff. Uh, without her, I would have, I may not even have a website at all. Without her, I would have something that looks like it was made from the 2000s, maybe even like 1998. So I really can't knock anybody else for their website because I have a golden goose of uh, technology and web design uh, in Rachel. So there's that. Um, I also have just really amazing people on our team. We take great photographs and all kinds of other things. It's a great team effort um, of which I get to contribute, but I am largely cannot take credit for how great our website looks. Now, with that in mind, uh, speaking about kind of the first question you had, has it been an active decision on the part of our business? Absolutely. Like if you think about like our website, it is the sole storefront for our store. 
yes, we do YouTube videos and we're on Facebook and we do this, that, and the other, and we have Instagram. And yes, technically you can click through and buy on Instagram, but it's all linked up through our store. Everything is through our store. We don't sell on Amazon. We don't sell on eBay. We don't, you know, link up with third party kind of stuff and do anything crazy. We don't do pen shows. We don't do, you know, we don't have a brick and mortar store. Everything is through one channel, which is our store. So for us, that is everything. I mean, it's every, it's everything. It's everything that you experience from a from a uh, a customer standpoint, from an actual shopping standpoint. Yes, you can read good information on our blog, and you can do all kinds of other stuff, interact with us on social media. But when you actually want to buy something from our store, that is all happening through our website. So for us to have a good user experience on our website is paramount, paramount for us, and we spend just an insane amount of time and money on our website. You would be shocked. And in fact, I think you're hearing less of this now because e-commerce is becoming, you know, kind of clearly more legitimate than it was 10 years ago when we started doing this. 10 years ago when we started doing this, a lot of the feedback was, well, you know, online, you don't have all the costs that you have with a brick and mortar. It's not a real business and all this kind of stuff which, okay, fair enough, if you're starting in your bedroom and all that, you can have some minimized costs. But we have nearly a 24,000 square foot warehouse with an enterprise level website. Believe me, we pay as much or more than a brick and mortar store would uh, for our space and all this type of stuff. Now, of course, we're not in like a major metropolitan area and all this type of stuff. Sure, I get that. We're not having to staff a storefront you know, for many, many hours a day. I get that. So it's not completely equal, but believe me, we spend an exorbitant amount of money to maintain our website and keep it updated because the standards are ever changing. You know, there's things that you don't even think about like ADA compliance and, um, you know, user experience and PCI compliance, you know, safety, security on the website, stuff that you just like assume is kind of taken care of. Those standards are ever changing and we have to constantly be on top of that stuff. Um, also we have, um, you know, uh, all like the credit card processing, all that kind of, that's all the PCI stuff. Um, that stuff has to all be secure. We work with third parties because they are like on that all the time. I wouldn't trust us to be on top of all the rules and regulations around that. So we work with third parties and that type of thing. Um, but in terms of what you're talking about here, which is like the, the faceted stuff and the faceted search and like we just rolled out a few weeks ago, you know, when you're going to a product page, like a pen page, for example, say you go to Banu. Um, and you check out the Banu hexagon, you're gonna see color swatches that show all the other colors of the hexagon. That is custom, that is custom code. We're on Shopify, that's our web platform. Even still, you pick a theme that's within the Shopify platform, so that's kind of like your architecture, your base of how it's gonna look and how the product page is gonna be structured. You can tweak a lot of that stuff, but we have gone even above that to get custom development done. So getting those little swatches that you see there, that required like a decent amount of time and energy on our part. Our photographers had to go and cut out actual pictures of the pen material to make those swabs, which look amazing by the way. I'm super proud of my team for that, um, for those swatches and super helpful thing. But like we had to use, we had to take all those pictures, create all those assets, crop them all out, decide how it was gonna be laid out. I think it was something like a thousand, a thousand different swatches. I'm not joking, a thousand that we had to crop out, manage, put on the site just for that one feature. Uh, and then we had to organize and put them on all the different product pages so they made sense and actually link to the correct things. Uh, and then we had developers that we use um, and pay on a, a monthly basis to do projects like that, to develop different things. So, I mean, it's at the point now where there's so much that we want to be doing on our website. You know, not only do we pay a base fee for the actual, you know, website hosting and all the other various things with it, but then we work with developers really on like a retainer basis because um, we don't have like full-time IT staff here. Rachel does a ton on the website and we all poke around and do plenty. Um, but in terms of like programmers, developers, we, we choose to work with a third party um, because they're, we got really great partners there. It just makes sense for us. Um, but they spend a good number of hours every month, um, you know, working on projects that we prioritize for them. They have ideas about what we should, what should be done based on what they're seeing in the greater, you know, um, e-commerce landscape. We have ideas based on the fountain pen world and what makes sense for us. The collaboration works really well there and we come up with ideas like the, the swatches, for example, um, that can be really good. So things like that, it's not just like an off the shelf feature that we can plug into kind of any old website and do. 
I mean, hours and hours and hours of development for that kind of stuff. So to hear that it's really valuable is super validating to us, to our team, um, to our developers even. Um, and then of course, when you vote with your dollars and we find that the things that we're doing to enhance our website are actually creating a better shopping experience for you and then you elect to shop with us instead of somewhere else because you know you can shop wherever you want but when you appreciate the experience you have with us and you support us it invigorates us gives us cash to reinvest into further development of the site so yes uh, that's that's very much a conscious investment on our part to do that coming from sort of a philosophical place of we want to be in a continuous improvement mode because that's almost kind of a standard with e-commerce these days. Um, but that is uh, certainly something for us uh, that we believe. And then, um, you know, you said, yeah, I can easily imagine that web design has an impact on traffic and business. Um, has it paid off? I believe that it has. It certainly has not been perfect all along the way. We've had various iterations of our platform or various features that we've built on our platform, um, various points along the way over 10 years that have been a complete waste of money, a complete waste of time, very frustrating to try to implement and not been a home run in terms of usability and, and user experience. Some of that is you never know until you go through it. Some of it is, you know, you get you, you make a commitment on a contract basis and you got to see it through and it turns out not to have paid off. Um, but we're trying to get smarter as we go, only develop things that we think are going to make a lot of sense. But it's like anything else. It's like when you, you know, have a physical storefront and you try and renovate it to whatever, improve your branding or improve the flow through the store or enhance certain things. Some of it, like you do your best guess and then you have to assess after the fact, was this actually worth it? Did it make sense? We do that kind of stuff all the time. But we're having regular conversations about that kind of stuff, and you're going to see continuous improvement from us for the foreseeable future. It's just going to be a part of what we do. So thank you very much for the compliments. Appreciate that. And we are always, always, always open to feedback and ideas about how we can improve our website. Because again, we are updating it constantly. All right, that's it for questions for this week, episode 260. My question of the week for you this week is if there was one thing that you could change about fountain pens, what would it be? Say that you're the ruler of the fountain pen universe. What would be your decree? Uh, and then I have a writing prompt for you. This is not anything that you need to share publicly, but if you're just looking for an excuse to break out your pen and break out your laser copy paper, um, write about where you were when you watched the moon landing or if you were not around when the moon landing happened, what's some other significant global event that you remember from your youth, a notable event, and where were you when that happened? Just write down your memory. Just take a trip down memory lane. It'd be kind of cool. I got a couple different ones that will date me a little bit, um, but one of them is kind of pertinent to here. I was actually, so Drew, who's our customer care manager here, I was actually playing laser tag at his house in seventh, eighth grade when I heard that Princess Diana died. Uh, and I remember his mom kind of called out, called us into the house, and we kind of watched the news as to what, I didn't understand who she was or what was going on at the time, but of course, I heard about it on the news a lot after that, but I just have a very distinct memory of like, you know, as it was dusk and we were playing laser tag in his front yard, uh, that's when I heard about Princess Diana dying. So, there you go. There's my random memory. Uh, but I thought that was kind of interesting just because uh, my, my memories with Drew go back that long. So I hope you had an awesome Q&A this week. I enjoyed doing it. Thank you for coming back time after time. Uh, I'll be back for you next week. Uh, and I am going to uh, bid you adieu. And I hope you are able to check out some of these things on GoulaPens.com. You can learn more about a lot of what I've talked about. You can also like, comment, or subscribe. It would be much appreciated by me and my team. I hope you have a great weekend and a fantastic rest of your week. Thank you so much for watching, and 